So the drivers of environmental change is the title for this uh, talk as an introduction to six other presentations that are going to be given on a monthly basis. The other six presentations will be given by experts and uh, I have the daunting task of introducing the topic and of course uh, we'll run the, into the danger of being entirely superficial. It will not be the first time that I've been accused of this. But the topic is of absorbing interest to me and I think that it is one of the crucial topics for all of us even if we recognize it or not. The issues surrounding environmental change are so pressing that uh, it is very hard to get a balanced statement uh, around the topic. And mine will unfortunately also be biased, but I should put out my biases right away so that you can see uh, from where, where I'm coming. And the first point at issue uh, for me is that landscape change is at the heart of environmental change. So that uh, I start off with the assumption that landscape change uh, is the, the matter that should in fact be at the core of the environmental change debate. Whereas in fact, uh, it has become a debate around climate change, which has taken the media and the public uh, as, their, as the main object of attention. So I hope to uh, make the point, not suggesting in any way that climate change is unimportant, of course it is important, but suggesting that it is, in fact, less important uh, than this whole uh, aspect of landscape change and the drivers that are pressing on our environment. So what I propose to do in the lecture is, first of all, give you some visuals of landscapes so that you can see what I'm talking about. Then there's a rather tedious section with some definitions which many of you will not need, but others may. And then the, we get to the guts of the argument, uh, and we end up with three conclusions. So without more ado, I should get to the visuals, and I'll say very little about them, except hopefully you will see uh, the relevance of them as we go. The first one is a, a, a picture of the Grand Canyon National Park, which gives us something of the magnificence of the uh, landscape of that part of the American Southwest, in which uh, we are reminded that topographic relief is a major driver of environmental change. Uh, in that landscape, we're looking at the history of 1.6 billion years of uh, environmental change from the surface of the plateau to the bottom of the canyon uh, there's a rather complete record of changes not just of climate but also of sea level and the like two very different ways of looking at this image one an aesthetic approach thinking of the value of landscape uh, in aesthetic terms or in uh, geological terms uh, in terms of how much is revealed about the history of landscape in a single shot of this kind. But I will be emphasizing uh, as part of this lecture the importance of topographic relief as an agent of environmental change. By contrast with the Grand Canyon National Park is this a uh, photograph of the capital city of the Maldive Islands, which is located on a coral reef platform. And the average elevation above sea level of this uh, city, a city of 100,000 people, 
is one meter. And uh, the, the peak, the highest point of the landscape itself is 1.5 meters. I include this in order to introduce in landscape terms this whole topic of the role of sea level as a driver of environmental change. Some of you who are purists will tell me that sea level is simply a derivative of climate anyway and therefore should not be separated out. But there are many reasons why I would like to separate it out. One of which is that it is not entirely a function of climate. Sea level, in fact, is rather more complex than that. But also, more importantly, there is a particularly important zone of the coast along which the sea level acts as, a, as an environmental agent of change. And for that reason, it uh, deserves some special attention. A third image, which is not strictly a, a landscape picture, but uh, simply reminding us of the importance of uh, hurricanes and uh, the difficulty of dealing with hydroclimate as an agent of environmental change. Uh, we have all been convinced, to a greater or lesser extent, that the climate is changing in a single direction of warming. Uh, but the other aspects of that change, which have to do with hydroclimate, namely the way in which precipitation and runoff are influenced by this uh, changing climate, is rather more difficult to get at. And this uh, image is simply to remind us that uh, uh, if you can see a trend in that uh, diagram below, then you're much cleverer than I, and I'm sure you are. Uh, but it's a very difficult, a difficult thing to establish the changing uh, magnitude and frequency of events in hydroclimate and to get any sense of the trend that is involved. And I think we're far too gullible, uh, in many cases, accepting uh, statements about trends. A fourth image, which is uh, showing the valley of the Nile River, uh, it's actually passed through 90 degrees, uh, and uh, north is to the right. Uh, and this is, in fact, uh, just below the high Aswan Dam. Luxor and Thebes and the Valley of the Kings are all in this image, which is 160 kilometers uh, on the side. Uh, this whole landscape uh, is remarkable in the sense that you can see how important human activity has been in changing the desert into this uh, uh, landscape of human, uh, not in human activity, but civilization over so many millennia. So these four images I wanted to introduce before getting to the more uh, tedious discussion, uh, which involves definitions. And if you'll bear with me, I need to read these in case I get them wrong. And uh, first of all, to define what I mean by landscape. It's an intermediate scale region comprising landform assemblages, ecosystems, and anthropogenically modified land. This definition derives directly from Alexander von Humboldt's definition back in the mid-19th century, which was the total character of a region which includes landforms, vegetation, fields, and buildings. Such a definition does not include a delimitation of spatial scale, but in the context of environmental change, it's useful to impose some constraints. The suggestion here, as shown in the next image, which is a plot of every place on Earth uh, on the x-axis, defined in terms of spatial scale, and on the y-axis, defined in terms of temporal scale. The suggestion here, as you can see, is a preferred range of spatial scale from 1 to 100,000 square kilometers, and temporal scale 
of decades to millennia. The rationale for the spatial scale restriction is not that it provides great precision. Obviously, this range, uh, 100,000 square kilometers, is an absurdly broad range. But it eliminates very small and very large areas from consideration. In other words, patches, plots, and angels on the heads of medieval pins are far too variable to provide a reliable signal of what is happening. And landscape belts are too large to respond meaningfully to drivers of change within the foreseeable future. The rationale for the temporal scale restriction is that time periods shorter than a decade are unreliable indicators of trend, and time periods greater than millennia in the past are simply not analogous with respect to the drivers of change. And time periods longer than centuries into the future are entirely unpredictable in the present state of our science. So I'm making some dogmatic statements there, which you may wish to challenge me on later, but th these are the assumptions that I'm uh, bringing to these talks. I cannot pretend that these definitions are rigorous, but I believe that they are helpful in narrowing the debate. And then further, I should say, my own motivation in this research is love of land, awe in the face of creation, and a sense of the awesome responsibility that we have in attempting to be stewards and wise users of land. So much for that part of the discussion, and I need to move on. A man called Schnellhuber, Schellnhuber, I should say, uh, produced a diagram somewhat similar to this, which I have modified uh, in various ways. In particular, I've modified it with respect to a set of processes and the final comment, col column, which is called impact of these potential changes on society an educated guess. So I, I'm calling myself educated uh, and I'm making a guess. The way to read the table is that we go to the high impact column on the right first because presumably this is something that we should be uh, particularly concerned about. And I, I think the most interesting thing is that only one of those high impact uh, processes has a low uncertainty of knowledge. That is to say, we know very much about it. We know very much about what our society does to the land. Anthropogenic change is far better understood than any of these other processes that are listed on the left-hand side of the table. One would imagine, therefore, um, at least simplistically, from my uh, naive perspective, that there would be very much more attention paid to anthropogenic change, given the state of knowledge that we know that is modifying the environment around us. But as you know, that has not been the, the case recently, uh, and much capital and much time has been paid <coughs> in trying to uh, tackle these other processes. What you can see is that there is no, uh, no absolute knowledge in relation to these processes. A great deal of uncertainty uh, as you move down the list. And this uh, also, of course, is an incentive for research and has generated a lot of, uh, of work uh, in the last little while. But you see that the, the question of positive feedback in the system, questions of carbon dioxide release, from the land's biosphere and the behavior of inland ice, that is to say the ice sheets, particularly Antarctica and pieces of Antarctica, as well as pieces of the Greenland ice sheet, uh, could be extraordinarily important. It's, a, it's an interesting uh, exercise to actually try to work out uh, the range of interpretations uh, and the imp impacts of these processes on the environment. Now, a few more general 
uh, images. This is the uh, work of Petit Mer and uh, Buis from Paris, uh, who have, in, with the advice of an international panel, put together the extreme variation in environmental conditions between 20,000 years before the present and 8,000 years before the present, the last glacial maximum being, on average, somewhere around 20,000 years before present, and the warmest part of the Holocene being about 8,000 years before the present. And you can see in these maps how mass massive uh, is the environmental change that has occurred uh, over that time period, and you can see the way in which the major biomes have shifted dramatically over time. Skip Ray in the history department has written a book called I Have Lived Here Since the World Began, which is a marvelous discussion of First Nations uh, historical development. But for the purpose of this talk, I just wanted to use one of his diagrams in which we see the way in which the interaction of uh, human activities with the changing environment, nothing new, and the drastic nature of the impact of environmental change on early people in North America, uh, emphasized by the movements along the ice-free corridor, uh, which uh, of course gradually opened up uh, in the period post 15,000 years before the present. And another general point before I get to the, the main argument, uh, the work of uh, Jared Diamond uh, in the book Collapse, which I know uh, scholars in history deplore, or some scholars in history, I don't suppose present scholars in this room in history would deplore it, but given my own uh, family connections with uh, the Vikings, uh, struck me as an interesting example here of the way in which society and environment interacted in the context of Jared Diamond's thesis with respect to collapse. And of course, not only environmental conditions were to explain the success or failure of these Viking migrations, uh, the distance from supply routes, the level of opposition of the local population to the migrating Norse people. That was also a factor, but he placed his great emphasis on the way in which the landscape presented constraints on the development of the immigrants' communities uh, in those new parts of the world. So that's all introductory and passing, and hopefully you get some sense of the scale at which I'm talking and the kinds of issues about which I am going to be talking. Uh, this couple of maps may not startle you, but they constitute uh, very hard work on the part of Dr. Pamela Green at the University of New Hampshire. At my request, she produced these uh, maps because I'm incompetent to actually do the analysis. And uh, what you see is uh, the importance of relief and the combination of relief and relief roughness so that you have one statistic for relief roughness and another for relief typology, giving you the major mountain ranges of the world. To talk with much greater insight about this, uh, we have Professor Schreier coming all the way from IRES to speak to us in a couple of months' time. Why do we have to stop at the issue of relief? Uh, relief is not going to be changing a great deal over the next century. Why do we uh, necessarily look at it? Well, uh, a lot of discussion is fruitless uh, around the environmental change topic because people insist on comparing places with totally different relief, totally different tectonic contexts, and totally different uh, uh, rates of change. And there's, no, there's nothing mysterious about that as illustrated uh, in this next image, which is associated with the work of Wilkinson and McElroy at Harvard, 
where they have simply mapped the distribution of relief and uh, elevation and converted that into a rate of landscape change through a, a simple, very simple equation developed by Summerfield and Halton in 1994. And those characters discovered through a very extensive analysis of large regions of the Earth's surface that one could actually predict the rates of change of landscape with the aid of simply relief and, uh, and uh, elevation. So uh, that map, which, as you see, is the United States, or the conterminous United States, emphasizes that there are two orders of magnitude difference uh, in the rates of landscape change. In addition to that, the work of Niels Hovius at Cambridge has uh, emphasized the influence of the tectonic setting on environmental change. And here what Niels has simply done is to take the degrees of activity in the plate tectonics, which are from the top of the diagram to the bottom of the diagram, but by far the, the most rapid change going on in Taiwan, which is uh, so uh, dr drastically uh, associated with contracting uh, plates side by side. And so the, the simple relationship that was discussed previously is modified by tectonic setting. And that's not at all difficult to understand. Then I wanted just to illustrate both from British Columbia and from Austria how the relief varies, uh, which is possible to determine through shuttle radar topographic uh, mission. This is based on 90 meter digital elevation data analyzed by Dori Kovanen, my re research associate. And what this shows is the <coughs> fact that uh, we have not only a mountainous province, but also surprising to many people is the fact that in the midst of those mountains, there are a lot of places that simply are not mountainous. So we've got the obvious major Rocky Mountain, Columbia Mountain, and Coast Mountains chains. But uh, those of you who know the Prince George area will realize that it's not very mountainous, even though the elevation is well above uh, 1,000 meters. It's also interesting to note that we're not as mountainous as uh, Austria. The Austrian Alps are considerably more rugged. And that uh, the interesting thing that is reflected in the next map, which is a map of Austria, this is a map of the distribution of debris flows in uh, the frequency and magnitude of those debris flows, which are a direct relation, in direct relation to the relief uh, of, the, of the landscape. So a quite simple point that we have to take into account the relief, and we're more and more able to do so, uh, especially if we have research associates who know how to do the calculations. Sea level. I mentioned that sea level was rather more complex than simply a matter of climate. Uh, but this map uh, will, I hope, be of interest to those who can imagine what the British Isles look like in the absence of Ireland. Uh, but if you look closely, you will see that there's something odd here. It's not just a reflection of the fact that sea level has been rising, because in Scotland, relative sea level has been dropping, or well, the land has, relatively speaking, been emerging, and uh, England and Wales have been sinking. This has nothing to do with the political affiliations uh, or, indeed, the populations of those countries. But there is essentially, if you look at it, four, four of those graphs at the top in Scotland are, are essentially demonstrating the fact that the land is rising as a result of the asystatic readjustment from the load of ice that obtained on top of the land uh, until relatively late in the Pleistocene. The fact that England and Wales are sinking is, is a sad commentary, especially for Welsh people, 
But there, there is the, the complication, which, of course, is also applies to Canada, because we have, uh, and relatively speaking, in the north, uh, rapid emergence. Uh, the whole of the Hudson's Bay illustrates that very well. Uh, and uh, then submergence occurring uh, in the south. However, that complication aside, it hasn't stopped people from noting a trend. And this trend being taken in parts of the oceans, which are relatively, uh, where, where the, the, the land level is relatively uh, stable and no uh, particular response to glacial effects. And these reconstructed sea level fields, if you note, with the y-axis is in millimeters of change, and the record that you're looking at is, dates from 1870 to the present. And as you can see, uh, it's become more and more precise as you go further back. So you see the confidence levels uh, of the error bars are that much wider apart. But there is a clear trend uh, in global mean sea level, uh, with the change being of the order of one centimeter uh, over the course of that time period. As part of the IPCC process, which I mentioned here uh, in passing, I'm not really giving a very uh, careful review of, of the IPCC process, but one of the rather interesting side effects of the IPCC process is this development of emissions scenarios. And these emission scenarios have been used in so many of the global environmental change uh, uh, discussions from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment to the World Heritage uh, Sites pr process uh, to the, gl the Global Environmental Outlook uh, with UNEP. A whole series of, of these processes of investigation of environmental change have used these emission scenarios to see exactly how effective uh, any change in our behavior might be in relation to uh, the future sea level. And uh, uh, just to mention that A1B, the balance of fossil and renewable energy sources, is the one that is most commonly quoted as being the most likely scenario for the future. Sea level, on the basis of these different scenarios, has got a very narrow range of expected change. Whether it's the, the most profligate scenario of A1F1, which is really quite uh, 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 ignoring any uh, of the uh, concerns about the use of fossil fuels and so on, even that gives rise to a relatively small sea level change uh, over time. We're talking here about uh, meters, these uh, numbers in the right-hand column uh, are, are in meters over the next 100 years, and none of them is greater than 0.6 of a meter over that time frame. The biggest concern, as you all know, is that uh, parts of Antarctica and Greenland could break away and completely confound those predictions. But insofar as that uh, work is done. Uh, Tom Spencer at Cambridge has done this uh, analysis of the predictions that were made between 1983 to 2001 of the potential sea level rise by the year 2100. And you can see that all these predictions have become progressively more modest uh, over time. But bear in mind that they do in fact lead uh, out, they leave out the most serious problem of what to do uh, with the ice streams and their tendency to flow more rapidly and uh, produce potential disaster. Hydroclimate, this is the most familiar uh, set of, foot, of maps from the IPCC 2007 uh, report, and we don't have time to go into it in detail, but just to note that the areas that are stippled, if you can see, that, can you see the stippling on, on these maps? The areas that are stippled are regions where 80% of the models agree on the sign of the mean change. That's to say, they agree on the, on the direction of the change. 
And what is intriguing is that if you look at the soil moisture and the runoff maps, are the ones which have the smallest areas stippled. That is to say, the greatest amount of uncertainty is associated with these two parameters of soil moisture as far as agriculture is concerned and runoff as far as the uh, reliability of the runoff for water resources is concerned. Similarly, if we look at the uh, predictions of and the success in achieving predictions on the level of snow cover and uh, snow amounts, uh, there is a series of assertions made that uh, snow cover uh, is getting smaller as on the basis of uh, remotely sensed imagery. Uh, but th the image, which we can't see at the moment, demonstrates that that is an extremely difficult uh, statement to demonstrate. Also in the context of uh, hydroclimate and its effects on the landscape, uh, we are most interested in, uh, in many ways in the largest rainstorms, in the most intense hurricanes, uh, which we are told are clearly getting more intense over the course of the last decade. There is good evidence to suggest that that is happening, but it's not entirely clear. Um, I have data in the next uh, diagram, which we may or may not see, uh, in which we look at the incidence of large rainstorms in the tropics, uh, where it, uh, it is not at all clear that the trend is in the direction of greater intensity. And it, there's also considerable difficulty with the analysis of the data as to whether you choose a particularly intense rainstorm at one level or another. Trends seem to be different, let's say, for a 50 millimeter rainstorm day as compared with a 75 millimeter rainstorm day and a 100 millimeter rainstorm day. The trend in the uh, direction of intensity is, is, is not the same. And indeed, one of the most interesting uh, discussions about the importance of hydroclimate in, in its transformation of the environment is taking place in Japan, where the incidence of debris flows is rather a, a common uh, occurrence. And uh, the work that uh, I'm aware of in the context of the Sabo Works program uh, in Japan has not been able to demonstrate uh, any change in the intensity uh, of the uh, occurrence of debris flows. So we come uh, at, at the end to the issue of human activity, which uh, is, for people in the room who are in the humanities or in environmental history, would not come as a surprise to see that human activity far outweighs the effects of changing climate, the effects of changing sea level, and the effects of relief. However, to the uh, geoscience community, it does seem to be still a bone of considerable contention. And uh, there's still a, an element of disbelief, and particularly amongst those who reify climate as being the responsible party uh, for all changes. We have data here for the uh, growth of cities in deserts. For example, uh, I don't know whether you've thought at all about the way in which urbanization uh, changes the landscape. Clearly, uh, you may have thought of it in terms of the cityscape, but in relation to the definition of landscape as given by von Humboldt, the cityscape is very much a part of, of landscape. And what one can see from the data from the United Nations Population Division, Department of Economic and Social Affairs, for 2007, we now have 40 million people in the top five cities located in deserts. That's to say more than the population of Canada is, is actually concentrated in Riyadh, Khartoum, Tehran, Cairo, and Karachi together. So that, uh, the, and, and the, of course, the, the projection is that these are logarithmically increasing uh, into the future. But as of today, there are 40 million people in those top five cities, completely transforming the desert, and also, of course, transforming the water supply 
uh, that uh, feeds those uh, cities. If, if, if you've ever been to Las Vegas, you will have been impressed with both the profligacy of the use of water, but also the fact that the water does have to travel rather a long way to get there. Uh, if we look at the impact of uh, farmland uh, in North America, uh, the far greater transformation of the environment produced by farmland than by any climate or uh, hydroclimate uh, that we're aware of. It's also of interest, I think, that uh, the production of uh, dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico did not start with the uh, BP uh, accident uh, at the beginning of this year, but that the dead zone in that part of the Gulf of Mexico has been building uh, for many years. Concentration of uh, phosphates and nitrates coming off the, the land surface of the Mississippi and the Ohio system uh, has progressively built up a completely dead zone over that whole area where the oil spill has now reinforced uh, that trend. If we look at the, uh, at the spectrum of land uses between forestry, agriculture, and grazing, we can see a three orders of magnitude difference in the effects of these, uh, of these human activities on the landscape. We also are seeing epic levels of erosion. Uh, Roy Seidel has done special work on this in Yunnan, uh, particularly demonstrating through the images uh, the epic levels of landslide erosion along newly constructed Weishi Shangri La Road in Yunnan. And if, if any of you have been there, it's a quite a spectacular example of the way in which human activity is completely transforming. Uh, that environment, and similarly also the connectivity of landslide sediment and the Mekong River in, in, the, in Yunnan uh, demonstrates an extraordinary level of impact uh, of uh, people's activities in road construction on the environment. Uh, a further topic which uh, you'll hear about from Professor Church uh, in some detail later on in the new year has to do with the impact of damming of the rivers of the world, and of course the Nile is a, is a great example. And uh, one of the interesting things which uh, Mike Church has done is to look at the nature of the predictions that were made uh, before the construction of the Aswan High Dam, and the extent to which those predictions have actually come true. And uh, there is a list in uh, one of his papers in which he uh, and uh, he will probably be able to explain this for us more carefully. But the following predictions, reduced agricultural production uh, has not been fulfilled. In fact, there's been an increase in agricultural production. This was the snow cover map uh, in which the red color indicates increasing uh, amounts of snow and the Blue color indicates smaller amounts of snow. And if you can actually uh, make a generalization about trend uh, from that map, then you certainly are considerably more uh, expert than I. But that, that was the basis for prediction or statement that trends are changing. Here's the frequency of days with uh, high precipitation. This is a, a map of the debris flows in in uh, Japan. This is a picture, or a couple of pictures of Las Vegas, one from 1972 and then second one on the right from 2000, indicating the change from a population of 100,000 to a million uh, and the enormous uh, extent of the agricultural and, uh, uh, well, the, the green space and the water demand that's placed upon that uh, and this is the graph of the growth of population of cities in the desert. Uh, and uh, you can see the, the top five there. This is the work on cropland uh, erosion, which uh, is 
an order of magnitude or more higher uh, than the natural erosion uh, that is shown on the previous uh, map. Uh, the difference being that in this case, the, the change, of course, is in the lowland areas of the, of the uh, country, uh, by contrast with the, the previous map showing the importance of change in the high relief areas. This is the demonstration of the impact of nitrates and phosphates coming off the Missouri, Mississippi, Ohio basin. And the red zone is the zone of dead, uh, uh, essentially no oxygen available uh, in that area, which is precisely the area in which the oil spill uh, recently occurred. This is the, uh, the graph showing the relative rates of change associated with different uh, land use activities. And these are the uh, f photographs from Yunnan, uh, from the Shangri-La uh, Weishi Highway, and the top end of the Mekong uh, in Yunnan. Here is the long longitudinal profile of the Nile River and the amount of construction of dams uh, along the, the way. But the image that I showed earlier on of the Nile River is, is down here, 500 kilometers from the, from the, the coast, and uh, is uh, essentially uh, impacted by the, the, uh, the dam. And here is the, the range of uh, predictions that uh, Mike Church has looked at, and the extent to which uh, they were either uh, confirmed or not confirmed, or in some cases have been partially confirmed. The most serious uh, implication uh, of that dam construction, and of the series of dam constructions, is the erosion of the coastline at the delta of the Nile. And uh, this uh, is a, a major uh, problem, demanding uh, coastal defense works uh, along the whole of the, the Nile Delta. One of the difficulties with the debate around environmental change has been the tendency for only negative predictions and only negative uh, uh, thoughts to be uh, emphasized. And it is important, it seems to me, that, that one looks at the positive aspects of uh, landscape change as well as, as negative aspects. And the importance here of an example from Ethiopia in which the change in the landscape from 1975 to the year 2000, uh, well, I should say 2006, was work done under the supervision of Jan Nissen from uh, the University of Ghent, in which they have compared the uh, landscape over this time period with uh, a series of uh, photographs of the extent to which improvements in the landscape have been made. Much of the uh, emphasis on the negative uh, misses the point that, that the, the, the landscape can be improved and enhanced uh, by careful and wise stewardship. And so this, uh, this example, I think, is, is a very helpful one. The, the methodology is interesting. Again, it's order of magnitude methodology. It's not the sort of precision that uh, some of our uh, microscale scientists would wish, but on the other hand, it's pretty compelling evidence. And these are a couple of photographs uh, which were lent to me by Rolf Kellerhaus uh, from Switzerland, from the Uri Canton, which indicate the improvement in the landscape uh, as a result of afforestation. Uh, the left-hand photograph from 1911 uh, followed a dramatic 33-hour rainfall in the uh, previous June. And then there was a forestation over the period 1932 to 60. And uh, you can see the effect as demonstrated in the photograph on the right from 1981. You can pick out the individual buildings and uh, see the extent to which uh, landscape improvement occurred. Well, let me come to my conclusions. 
first of all, the statement uh, of this uh, table, which is, a, again, a, a semi-quantitative uh, guess of the relative importance of the four drivers of change, which is a qualitative scoring by experts, a series of people who contributed to a book which I edited uh, together with Tom Spencer and Christine Embleton Harman in 2009, published by Cambridge University Press, in which we examined uh, environments or biomes, uh, in this case, mountains, lakes, and lake catchments, rivers, estuaries, beaches, and coral reefs, and then zones or biomes, tropical rainforests, tropical savannas, deserts, and so on, and made some back-of-the-envelope estimates of the relative importance of the four major drivers. And as you will see, um, with the exception of the Arctic, where clearly climate and hydroclimate is dominant, part partly because climate ch is changing more rapidly in, in the Arctic than anywhere else, and partly because the population levels are still rather low. But if you actually look at the column under human activity, you'll see that by far the largest number of uh, asterisks uh, are associated with human activity. Well, you might say that uh, just confirms your bias, and uh, yes, it does. I fully accept the charge. However, some folks, particularly Peter Kareva at Columbia University, has done some very interesting work. One of you noticed when you saw the background to the title of this talk uh, that there was something odd about this map. It doesn't look like population distribution. In fact, it's a, a map of the human fit footprint on Earth. And it's a very cunning methodology and uh, is certainly open to improvement. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about it in science. Uh, the measure that is used is expressed as a percent of the human influence relative to the maximum influence in each biome. Whether you can get your head around that one. Uh, each biome is looked at separately. Whichever part of the biome is most impacted by human activity, and then the scale is relative to that maximum. And the data that are included in this are not only human population density, but the extent of land transformation, the electrical power infrastructure, and the access to land by road systems and the like. So that what this represents is a first order estimate of the impact of human activity uh, on the landscapes of the world. I must come to a close. I apologize for the interruption of the service. But the three conclusions to which I have come in this uh, discussion. Well, first of all, the human activity in the form of land use and land cover change has become the most important driver of landscape change globally. And it is anticipated that human activity will become increasingly dominant as the 21st century progresses. The integrity of my argument depends on defining and comparing effects at specific temporal, that is to say century, and spatial landscape scales. If my argument is valid, firstly, models of future landscape change extrapolated from paleoenvironmental reconstruction models are fundamentally flawed. Secondly, the investment of capital in detecting temperature change to the ne neglect of losses of soil, water, water quality, and prime agricultural land following intensification of human activity seems unwise. And thirdly, the landscape change debate should open itself to the possibilities of landscape enhancement as well as land degradation. So I think uh, I leave you with this uh, conclusion, and uh, I expect to be challenged on it. Uh, it's something that I would hope that we could be able to check on as the experts from different parts of the world come to give their lectures, that we might uh, find out to what extent they see these effects as 
as comparable or whether they think uh, that in fact something entirely different uh, is the case. I'm certainly open to correction uh, at any time. It seems to me that we have to be responsive to new data and we have to, have to be responsive to new interpretations of old data. And uh, this is, in my view, the essence of the university. And uh, I hope and trust that the community at St. John's uh, will indeed be receptive to a debate uh, around these issues. Thank you. Thank you.